Uh, this is Seattle Real Estate Chat, and every week at 10 o'clock, myself and Rhonda Porter, uh, a lender here locally, uh, talk about real estate issues in the Seattle area for uh, buyers and sellers who may have issues or questions about how things work. Rhonda, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, I'd be glad to, Jim. Uh, I'm Rhonda Porter. I'm a licensed loan officer uh, located in the greater Seattle area, and um, we've been doing these calls now for a couple of weeks, and uh, we're happy to have you watching us, joining us here at our chat. So today's topic is agents and lenders who wear two hats. And what we're talking about here are lenders who act both as a real estate agent and a loan officer for a client, a buyer, and real estate brokers who work uh, on both sides of the transaction, both on the listing side and the buying side representing a buyer. Uh, uh, we call it dual agency and uh, some of the risks and pitfalls of that and maybe a little bit of understanding of how that works and why it is the way it is. Um, so maybe we'll start out a little bit with uh, situations with lenders and I'll ask uh, Rhonda a couple questions around this and maybe she can throw in some ideas as to how this works. Rhonda, why, why would a, um, an a, a loan officer also want to be the agent? What's the advantages to the buyer or the borrower? Well, that's kind of, I think why, first of all, I don't do that. I guess I should start with, I, I only originate mortgages. I, I think it's really important to um, oh, just. Rhonda, let me interrupt you. I think we, can you hear a double sound in there? I think we got I, something going on here. I don't. It's, it's okay on my end. Okay, I think what's going on is that the, one of us has a YouTube channel on with Oh, it was me. Sorry. I, had, okay. I thought I had that muted. Uh, okay. Anyway, go, ahead. go back to what you started to say. Okay, no, no problem. No problem. Um, I think that oftentimes people have really good intentions when, when a loan officer uh, decides to be a real estate agent or a real estate agent decides to be a loan officer. And it can't even, maybe it happens because they, um, you know, you start off as one or the other and you, and you see the other side of the um, transaction thinking that you can do a better job than the other person. I mean, who knows why it starts. Um, but uh, for me, I just uh, originate mortgages because it is—it's a full-time job. I mean, there, there's so much to keep track of with regulations and uh, changing underwriting guidelines and whatnot. Um, so it's um, concerns me when I see loan officers become real estate agents and, and vice versa. It's—it's it's not uncommon. I mean, I—I I think that sometimes perhaps there's a pitch to the borrower that um, you know it's going to save them a step or this one person knows all their information um, and so perhaps they're promoting that it's going to be uh, easier for the person or, or whatever but um, it's it, it's concerning to me I guess is what I would say when I see it just because there is so much to know. Um, for, there, for are, there specific, are there specific risks or dangers for the buyer or pitfalls that they might not be aware of when getting in getting that kind of situation? Well, I know like for me, there's sometimes when I'm working with a buyer and they may not want their real estate agent to know um, that they are qualified for more homes. So so maybe they're looking at a price range like around 400000 but they can really afford 500000 You know, they, they have a significant down payment or, or whatever. And, and so once that buyer works with a um, loan officer who's also their real estate agent, they, they can't pull that information back. So... Um, so it's kind of, uh, it could put them in a precarious situation or, or give them less control over their, their financial information. Yeah, I can tell you from a real estate broker's perspective, when I'm working uh, with a, a lender who is also the loan officer uh, as a listing agent, uh, I, I get a little squeamish about that relationship too, just in terms of trying to know, have transparency about the transaction. There's times when I call a, lending, a lender about what's going on with the loan, finding out what's the real skinny here about underlying conditions and stuff like that, that if that's also the the buyer's agent, um, I'm not, sh I just feel like I might not be getting the full, the full skinny, the, the whole meal deal of the information that I'm looking for, uh, that they might be holding back stuff that, uh, that if they were not wearing both hats I'd be able to get. I don't know if that makes sense but uh, but I have had that happen. Right, right. And um, 
it's just I, I don't know. I, I would think that if you have someone in that situation too, like where they are being a loan officer and a real estate agent, that um, both jobs I think just demand a, a lot in the, in this market. There's a you know there's a lot of uh, regulations and requirements to know um, for a real estate agent and, and as well as there is for a loan officer. And I don't know how personally. It's just totally my opinion. I know there's probably people that ever do a great job at this, but um, I just don't know how you could do both jobs well, you know, so. No, that, that makes sense for my end too. There's so many times I'm working with a buyer uh, who starts to uh, go into questions around financing and I just, I keep aware of the highlights of the programs. I don't, I don't know all the details that, you know, when loan limit amounts change and uh, rates change by a quarter point a couple times a day and all that kind of stuff, there's, there's no way I can keep up with that as well as all the stuff I need to know to be really good, competent real estate broker. Uh, so I'm constantly referring them to their lender. You know, when it comes to, you know, they're saying, "Well, what if I got a HELOC and I wrapped this, and is, I think I could use these assets?" Or, "Well, how do you think I should?" Report? I don't know. That's, <laughs> you know, let me let me get Rhonda on the phone. Yes, that's why I've got a right. speakerphone. We can talk about it in the car if you want, or you can have a private conversation with her later. But right. uh, she's the person to ask on that, and that way I just. I can say focused on what I do, and I, I know you feel the same way about that. Right. Well, it can be too, like like even during the transaction, not just as far as like how much you can be approved for as a buyer, but you might have something come up where, um, you know, you might not a buyer or borrower where they might not want their agent to know, you know. Uh, so, and there's just there's no going back once you've entered that you know relationship in in the contract. Yeah, and uh, you know I, I like to know things, but there's things I'd rather not know too. Uh, especially private information. I don't ever want to know someone's social security number or their or their bank account numbers or stuff like that. I have no need for that. I'd rather that was never in, in my line of, of information because then there would never be any need to have any suspicion if they ever had a problem. So right. um, uh, it's just better. Uh, any way I can keep that shielded from me, I ask them to do so. Um, Let's move on to dual agency, where oh, yeah. we've got the situation on my side, and this is uh, is very common. Uh, I would say probably about 40, 50 percent of the brokers practice it on a regular basis. Um, I don't. Uh, I have done it a few times in the past, as I mentioned to you, a handful, maybe half a dozen out of my hundreds or thousand transactions I've done uh, that I've done dual agency, and it's been a very unusual situations. Uh, when it has happened, it's been where two parties, who I know both of them, have come to me, asked for my assistance. They already know what they want to pay for the property, what they want to um, sell it for. Uh, they just need some help with paperwork. Uh, there's a lot of friendship involved usually in those things, and um, and those are the only few times I've ever done it. So uh, it's fraught with uh, with risk, and uh, any real estate designated real estate broker who's been in business, especially with a larger organization, will tell you. Uh, they have to pay for errors and omissions insurance, we call it, you know, uh, that the vast majority of the, you know, claims are in dual agency situations uh, the, that they end up getting in court and getting attorneys involved because something goes south and in that relationship there's all kinds of risks and liabilities. So uh, <clears throat> a, a really good broker friend of mine from a long time ago told me, you know, you, you often have choices in this business of take a high road or a low road. and uh, if you have that choice, why not just take the high road? You know, and if the high road is not get into a situation where you're 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 representing both sides, you're trying to to they call it double dipping in this in this business, where you're not trying to be greedy and get both sides of the commission, but you're truly trying to represent the client. You're there to represent and make sure that that other client gets represented well too by maybe referring them out to another agent or whatever, uh, so that they have their own representation. Why not do that? I mean, you will make a little less money, but you will also sleep better at night. You won't have to worry as much, and you probably will end up with more clients in the long run. So, right, right. Uh, that's that's how I approach it. Right, and I think that that this situation happens really easy. I mean, I'll, I'll see it from my end where a um, buyer um, has not selected a real estate agent to represent them, or and instead they'll walk right into a listing that's being held open on a weekend by the listing agent, or maybe they're walking to a builder's site and they work with the builder's site agent. And um, and they're just not being, they're not having their interests looked out for, and I don't think that they understand that that agent works for the seller, right, Jim? That's correct. And you know, anytime you start sharing information with an agent, 
uh, they're going to be using that to their benefit when they negotiate with you. You know, if you walk into the house and you're going, wow, I love this house, I've got to have this house. Oh God, I'd just give anything for this house. It's a good thing I have this windfall from having won the lottery, but I wonder how cheap I can get it. <laughs> well, then it comes time to negotiate the price. We know we kind of uh, have leverage because of how much you love it and how much you've got in your pocket that's kind of flow, uh, overflowing. And if you could just happen to get it cheaper, you would, but you necess not necessarily. You're happy to pay more if you have to. Um, that puts that uh, listing agent in a pretty, pretty powerful negotiation position, and you didn't even mean for them to be there, you know. Well, and then so. in that case, isn't it the that agent's duty to get the most for the home that they can for the seller? It's That's not correct. the best That's price correct. for the buyer. That's correct. But if you're in a dual agent situation, it's a no-win because you're also representing the buyer and trying to help the buyer get it for the lowest price. And you're trying to you're trying to do two things that are at opposite ends. It's like being a prosecutor and a defense attorney in court. You can't be both. One has to represent the defense. One has to represent the prosecution. And you can't represent the defendant uh, properly by doing both. So. Right. Um, that's the nature of it, and it's uh, it, it's it, it's pretty big deal. It's done nationwide, pretty much. There's one way or another you can do it in most states. Some places have made it technically illegal, but there are loopholes and ways to do it. So, um, the driving thing in here, I, I hate to say it, is greed, uh, trying to make more money, uh, and this is why realtors and a real estate agents uh, always advocate, or I should say, I shouldn't say always. It's mostly advocated that this uh, should be allowed, and the National Association of Realtors takes that position fairly strongly too. Uh, I think I just mentioned to you I was going to bring this up. There's a hang on while I screen share this. Okay. There's a letter that just came out um, from the president of the National Association of Realtors to the uh, Assistant Secretary of Housing because they're now um, going to require, or at least they're recommending to require, that for short sales. Uh, that um, dual agency not be allowed and uh, the uh, National Association of Realtors is pushing back hard on this and this is what they lobby for and, and I understand that they're out to protect their members here because there are many many members that make a lot of money by doing this dual dipping uh, process but um, it's not putting the the consumer uh, as the number one um, focus in my opinion but um, but they have a lot of lobbying power. I'm a realtor too, and and I understand that that's that's their primary function is to make sure that uh, that you know you're they're representing the people who pay the dues, the realtors. Uh, right. But I, I think consumer advocacy is kind of on the rise these days, and there is a there is a good chance that I think in the future um, you will see more of this kind of thing, like HUD is doing, uh, of disallowing dual agency for. Uh, at least things that they're involved with. I mean, they're very, very involved with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, secured loans, and so I think that they would have a lot of leverage to change that if the lobbying efforts out there uh, don't uh, keep them from doing so. Right, right. So, Jim, if you had a listing and um, a really nice, and you're sitting on a you know, beautiful, rainy Seattle afternoon, and um, a, a really nice couple comes in and they want to buy a home, or single person, whatever, um, what would you do? And they're, they're right there well, already and want to write up an offer. They, they want this house really bad. And, and that's great because I'm right representing the seller. I want them to buy that home. But as they're going through this process, it's very quick. I, I, well, I'm asking, do they have an agent? And if they say, no, could you help me? I say, I'd love to help you. However, on this home, since I'm representing the seller, if you don't have an agent, let me recommend somebody who's really good and, and get you some representation because I'm going to be representing the seller here and I want to make sure that you get a fair deal. Uh, but I'd really love you to be the buyer of the home <laughs> and my seller would love to sell it to you. Right. So um, I, I, I pretty quickly do a handoff to someone and, uh, and, 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 and I might get a referral fee for that but I disclose that to everyone and that buyer's agent that represents them at that point you know, needs to huddle with them and come up with a strategy and work out what they can do to get the best deal on the home while I'm representing the seller and you know it's it may seem like a Chinese wall if you will but it, it gives them way more representation than they would get if I said no problem I'd be happy to write it up for you and uh, and ultimately my seller is better off too because you don't get into those entanglements where uh, he said she said but the broker said um, where you have problems so 
Right. That's that's how I that's how I deal with that. The reality also is in an open house situation, usually maybe one out of seven people that come in that say they want to buy a home end up buying that home. They end up buying another home. So that's a great place for you to meet potential clients and turn them into buyers that work with you that end up buying properties that are not listed by you anyway. So it just becomes a moot point like 95, 98% of the time. But in those few instances where it does, uh, that's how I deal with it and you know, make sure that my seller gets that home sold to these people if possible uh, and yet not fall into the dual agency of, yeah, well, sure, I'll sell it to you because I'll make double the amount of commission. Sure, I'm happy to write right. it up for you. And then right. just end up going down this path that is it's a never-ending conflict of interest through the whole transaction. Right, so. right. I've seen a transaction recently where um, the buyer had uh, was working with the listing agent, same, same type of scenario. And for example, in this case, there were um, repairs that need to be done to the home. And um, the agent was really pushing for, you know, the buyer, his first time home buyer, to proceed with the transaction. And, you know, these pe the people probably didn't have a lot of money, you know, saved up for um, future repairs or whatnot. But it just, you know, it seemed kind of, to me, in my opinion, that it looked like possibly, you know, um, the agent was possibly really pushing for this because they were getting, you know, so much commission having both sides of the transaction. But they weren't totally looking out for that buyer's interest. Or perhaps if they were just representing the buyer, they might have said, let's find you another home. Maybe it was the only home for them, but it was just, it's just, it really kind of, you don't know, you know, until you're in that situation, what, what might come up in the transaction. Right, so. yeah, it pushes the edges of ethics uh, for all the parties involved, and I think um, it's, it, it could be avoided, uh, I think it would be great, and unfortunately it's, it's something we have to deal with, which is why we brought it up today. So yeah. I hope this has given buyers and sellers some perspective uh, of that situation and maybe ways to maybe avoid it. Uh, make sure you've got your own representation is really it uh, for both lenders and for real estate brokers uh, and for if you're a buyer and if you're a seller. And, um, and, and, and take advantage of that. I mean, that people are being paid through all parts of this process to do exactly that. So, uh, by gosh, use them and, uh, for what they're there for, and that is to represent you. Right. Jim, so does it cost a buyer any more to work with a buyer's agent? No, it doesn't. And uh, the way we've set up our commission structures uh, in this environment is that when a listing is taken, the commission is agreed to be paid by the seller and then the, to that listing company. And that listing company then breaks out a portion, often about 50%, if not uh, most of the time, to the selling cooperative agent. So, uh, so, the, so the, the money is already decided before it even hits the market in terms of how they get paid. Buyers, uh, agents are paid through the listing company and that's how that works. There's some Everybody's, well, I shouldn't say, there's some business models now that have been playing some games around that to try to get some of that money to be given back to the buyer, and sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. The, the listing company, though, has a contract with the seller for that money, and, uh, and so having it split up that way has been traditionally how that's done. Mm -hmm. um, I, we're kind of running out of time here. Uh, I think we've covered just the surface of this, but I think enough to give people some insights. If you've got additional questions, feel free to, to type them in. You can send them to our hashtag, uh, RE, what is it? It's uh, Seattle, Seattle RE chat. Yes. Thank you. So hashtag <laughs> Seattle RE chat. Uh, we'll follow them, them there. Or if you're going over to our YouTube channel, a lot of people are watching live on the YouTube because that's where this gets like a 30 second delay in it, then it's there and then it's posted there forever. Or for a long time, so you can also put questions there as well, either as it's, as we're doing the show or afterwards, and then we can come back next week and go over anything that you we missed that is important to you. Uh, tune in again next week. We haven't decided for sure our topic. It looks like it might be uh, home inspections, though. We've gotten a, a lot of interest in home inspection issues, and so that's one that um, I think we'll probably cover. Maybe bring an inspector or two into the into the discussion and. Uh, and see if we can find out some of the things specific to Seattle that uh, people need to be looking for when they're doing their inspections and that kind of thing. That'd be great. So, and also real quickly before we leave, we're going to be doing a home buyers uh, seminar here soon, aren't we? You're right, on October 5th. Oh yeah, that's right. And it's going to be at the Green Lake Library Saturday. Uh, and we do this, what, from 11 to 4, right? Right. 
Right. So uh, you have to register for it, but this is the course that if you were to take this course, you get certified by the Washington State Financing Commission for a variety of different programs that give them down payment assistance or uh, I guess even some lower interest rate programs, right, Rhonda? Um, the interest rates are pretty competitive, uh, lower mortgage insurance rates uh, with, with a lot of these programs. Um, and there's eight different types of down payment assistant programs um, that are really easy to qualify for for buyers. But and it's a good the, the class covers a lot about the home buying process. So even if you aren't interested in down payment assistance, um, if you're interested in learning more about the home buying process, I think the class is worth going to. Yeah, so we'll put that, we actually can't put the links of that in YouTube, they're a little restrictive about outside links to that, it's an Eventbrite uh, invite, but it's filling up quick, so I'll tell you what, we'll make sure and get it on the uh, the Twitter feed that has the same hashtag. Oh, good uh, idea. Yeah. And and that way people will know where, the, where to go to click to get registered for that, because I think it's over half full already. I, I, it, I it's filling up, it. we have it on both our blogs, our websites too, information how okay. to sign up for it. I yeah, believe. so, and I'll, I'll put annotations here on the YouTube, but if it gets viewed outside of YouTube, those things fall off. So, anyway, thanks again, folks. Please tune in again next week, next Tuesday, 10 to 10, 15, uh, uh, Seattle RE chat, Seattle Real Estate chat, uh, and thanks again for tuning in. Yes, thank you. Have a great week. Okay, bye now. Bye.